the hands of our shadows is back. Michael Andrew Badio, welcome. Hey, hi, Herman. <laughs> Thank yes. you, Mikey, for helping us with this Jason Becker fundraiser. And I can see you also brought in some serious guitars at the back. With enough donation, we can unlock these special items for you to use, like a video game character. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I can't wait. But it's such a great cause. I mean, you know, Jason Becker was such an amazing guitar player and. You know, like I, I had mentioned to you when when I was in the band Nitro, we had the same booking agent when he was in Cacophony, and I also knew their drummer uh, Kenny really well. He's from Chicago, and I wanted him to play in one of my bands, and it didn't work out. But our paths, you know, crossed again. You know, with Cacophony. Yeah, that that is awesome. You obviously you like you're from the scene at that time, right? Yeah. You, you, when when I got out of school, I sent Mike Varney. I saw him guitar player. He was doing this series called U.S. Metal, so I sent him this song. It was the dumbest title ever. It was called Dungeons of Love, <laughs> and it was like in my Dungeons of Love. I got signed to Shrapnel because of that song, and Mike told me that what he really liked is the way I would change keys. I didn't have static chords, you know, throughout a whole progression. And but I was at Ingve's very first show in L.A. with Mike and Cacophony. I can't say they were so much a part of that scene. Everybody knew Jason Becker and Marty. You know, they were part of that that era of guitars. And in my first album I was ever on, Marty was on. It was called U.S. Metal, Volume Two on Shrapnel. And Marty, that was his first album with Shrapnel too. So that's how far back we go. It's really cool. Was Mike Varney the guy to go to? What was the reputation? How was that going? Well, the way I I kind of look back on it, if you got signed to Shrapnel, it meant. You were in like the elite group, the special forces of guitar. How many people that he signed back then that are still really active and viable in music today? But、uh, yeah, it was a badge of honor to be on Shrapnel. Like I was really proud of it, you know. And Mike, Mike and I are good friends. And but I remember him telling me about you've got to see this guy Ingve Malmsteen. And I'm like, who, who? Oh, so you knew him before even Ingve was a thing then. Uh, yes. Yeah, I came out on Shrapnel a year before Ingve. Crazy. I, I, you know, I didn't know that went <laughs> that far back. That's that's insane. Yeah, those, those times, you know, just like with Kakafi and and Jason, you know, I was there, you know, so we interacted with them, you know. So it's more meaningful to me to see this and and to think about how brilliant Jason was on guitar. You know, Shrapnel was about being what Mike Varney considered the best of the best. For me to be part of that, I was really honored and. I never did any other Shrapnel albums, but a couple years later, I got signed to Atlantic Records. So I was on Warner Brothers. But Mike and I have always been really good friends. It's just I didn't do a Shrapnel record after that first one. That first one was got me to the second stage, which was getting on Warner Brothers. Our album came out in the late '80s. That's really when Cacophony was was bigger. So the scene had already matured, and but we had the exact same booking agent and. We had some really wild stuff happen between both of our, our bands. If you want me to tell the story, I'll tell it.、So. Yes, you gotta share with us some stories, please. This is a good one. Now, I'm gonna preface this by saying, a, I like Marty Friedman a lot. Now, I would be lying if I said we're super close friends. When I was signed to Nitro,、um, now we were the Warner Brothers label. It was Rhino Records, but they, the parent company is Warner Brothers. And so we had a lot of money for tour support. I mean, it was seriously big time, and we were playing clubs. But Cacophony was popular, so they were playing the same venues we were playing. We were both selling out, so we would like say go to Tucson. They would be in Phoenix during the day. We made these big posters, and it was that picture. If you know anything about Nitro, it's been on so many. Like heavy metal and like hair metal things, like bobblehead dolls with hair. This was our poster. We were in、uh, Arizona. I'm looking at our poster, and somebody draws like like makeup on me on the poster that I look like Alice Cooper. Then they draw stuff on Jim, and, and like、uh, and, and then our bass player looked like a pirate. Anyway, I'm like, this is pretty creative, but I'm pissed. Who would do that to our poster? We can, we're on tour again. All of a sudden. I'm in another venue, a few cities down the road, and I see another poster. I look like Alice Cooper. Jim looks the same. I'm like, we have a coincidence here. We have a thing going. So I didn't say anything. This happened a third time. Now I'm like, okay. I, I go up to Jim. I go, Jim, dude. And now the lead singer, Jim Gillette. Okay, you know him back in the days, big blind guy. He's over six feet tall. 
He is born with the fighting gene. He had a body like a Chippendales dancer, and he's a black belt in Gracie Jiu Jitsu. He is death personified. He sees this for the third. I go, dude, this has been happening, man. I go, it's got, we, we said, it's got to be cacophony. And he's like, wait a second, call our agent. And our manager, Howie, was part of the booking agency. And Jim's like, I'm going to beat their ass. <laughs> and so I go, okay. And so he calls, he calls Miko. He's like, I want you to tell Cacophony, you line up the band, you get the road crew, everybody else, anybody else they want. He goes, you line them all up, me against them. I'm going to beat their ass. And all of a sudden she's like, oh my God. <laughs> From that point on, miraculously, our posters look normal. Or if somebody drew on them, it definitely wasn't me looking like Alice Cooper. Now, I can understand that. I mean, it's not that I was so mad about it, but it just kept happening. But here's the end of the story. So we were at a NARM convention. It's a record convention. So where, where you would see like the, the Chili Peppers latest video, and then they were promoting it. it was an industry record convention. We're walking around the show, and all of a sudden we see this dude running at us. It's like, Jim, don't kill me, Jim. Don't kill me. I didn't do it. It was our singer. And here's Jim. Here's Marty. Marty's like basically begging for us. Like, I didn't do it, dude. I swear, bro. I, it was our singer, dude. And, and Jim's looking at me. I'm like, <laughs> and Jim starts laughing. He's like, it's okay. <laughs> I won't kill you. <laughs> you know, I mean, just the way he, he was so calm about it. Like, okay. <laughs> you know, it felt like Thanos sparing somebody from the snap. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was just insane. That, that is hilarious. You know what? I've been doing jujitsu since 2005. And uh -huh. I know how deadly and technical the black belts are. So if I'm someone who have no, who doesn't do martial arts and they told me some black belt guy might beat me up, I'm not even going to say hi. I'm just going to disappear off this planet and never play the guitar again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I got to say, my, Mikey, those posters, look, I would have drawn on them too because you guys look ridiculous. The hair. And I guess you got to be a, like a full black belt you know, like Jim, to be able to have that insane, the biggest blonde hair. It was like more over the top than poison. And the funny part is we look like a thrash band when we actually play. Looking back at the players back then, obviously you you took it to another level with the two double, you know, two hands, everything, you know, to make the show more interesting. And you see Jason Becker, he's like jumping around, the guitars are moving, Steve Vai, everyone had a vibe. They were like extremely animated, like a video game character on stage. And you couldn't really survive if you just stood there and played just looking at your guitar, right? It, was it like that? No, it, you, and you're exactly right. This was Hollywood. See, the biggest difference between one of, there's many differences, but one of the biggest differences is when you put it in historical context, there was no internet. The mecca of the music world was LA. And, and I remember moving from Chicago to LA. In six months, I morphed into this Michelangelo rock star looking guy. Basically, you had to look cool. I remember uh, the, there was a place called Gazari's on the Strip. It was right next to the Rainbow. I used to have a, a yearly calendar. And I remember we took our pictures and we were in one of the months on his calendar. And I remember thinking, you know, these other guys, they don't look cool. We're really cool. And uh, I look back at the calendar now, everybody looked the same. Big <laughs> hair in June, big hair in July, bigger hair in August. But the scene in, in Los Angeles, it changed you. And I learned another thing, too, about before I'm, I was really good at jamming. I grew up in the era where everybody jammed. But in L.A., I found I hardly jammed at all. 
If we had a verse, you played the verse the same way all the time. I wrote solos out, but I knew what I was going to play. There was not a lot of improvisation. And then I got signed. It was weird because I had a, we had a real clear cut idea what the music was like. When I went back home, I remember seeing a local metal band thinking these people look like a joke. This is like, this isn't, it's so far away from LA. You know, it's and nowadays with the internet, I think it leveled the playing field, but I still think LA is LA. It's a magical place. So I'm lucky I can remember all. <laughs> yeah, you remember them all. <laughs> That's right. Not everyone remember everything from the 80s, right? <laughs> no, I, I was lucky. I, you know, I, I don't smoke cigarettes. No, I drink beer and wine because, I mean, sometimes places I go to, it's safer to drink the beer than the water. So, yeah, I just remember a lot of those times because. I would always write things down. Like if I wrote a song uh, and I recorded it, I would put like July 2nd, you know, whatever, 1996, 3 a.m. It was a sunny day. I would say or write down so it would bring me back to those days. And uh, But yeah, there's just so many good rock and roll stories. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Dun, 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 space. <laughs> it's like grunge never happened. The funny thing is when grunge did happen, I was doing some guitar clinics and I had some kid tell me, solos suck, dude. And he was real young and I said, you know, it's okay. But in America, it doesn't matter if any guitar players in the United States want to do a solo. We're in the grunge era. I will play enough notes for all of you so the U.S. is cover! And that's the way I thought. I, you can't just change your style because somebody thinks something's not popular one month. You know? Wow, we hit the blindfold challenge. 36,500. Thank you for everyone who donated. Whenever you're ready. Don't tell me what key. I'll just kind of figure it out. What style you guys think? Something fast, right? We want to oh, see some right. shredding. We're putting a world-class guitar player in difficulty. We, we're making it hard for him. We're not even going to tell what key is, and he's going to start. That's how difficult it's going to be. One of these one of your signature lines here from sawtooth 2 thank you for getting this over to me i was watching an interview of you explaining the reason how to say the theory behind the how you were trying to get a guitar to get some top top of the line hardware but not costing shit loads of money can you tell me a little bit about the theory behind this please you know we both have big guitar collections so you know we know guitars what we try to do is simply, we want to bring people into the fold, being more inclusive, bringing people in. Our whole premise at Sawtooth is this. We put the best parts on that we can, and we keep the price point. So it's like the word is value, I guess. We will eventually make the really high-end guitars again, but I find it a really ch big challenge to keep it in a price point, you know, a, a price that's affordable where it's a really good guitar. But really, that's the premise. It's hard to beat Sawtooth price if they have a price point for a guitar you can pretty much be assured that that's the most features you're going to get like the one you have it's uh it's not that pricey but it's got duncans in and it. it's got a german made floyd you know it's really good parts it's like don't put a cheap double locking bridge that's not going to stay in tune yeah yeah but it's soft metal like a like a floyd rose special they suck yeah yeah, yeah those are the top of the line even the second to the top of the line the korean ones the ones made in korea are really good <laughs> You 
know, for someone that don't improvise, if you want to give an advice to someone that want to get into improvisation and jamming to tracks, you have what would you say to them? Well, tracks like this are good to jam on. My advice is don't write. Don't have preconceived ideas of what you're going to play. Like figure out the key. Uh, you know, if you're here A minor to F, okay. You know, depending on E minor, E major. But just jam out. What it, I think it gets communication between musicians. That that's what I think helps with jamming. Don't be afraid to make mistakes, right? You gotta go and make those mistakes to get better. Awesome. Thank you for those for that awesome advice. Everybody, get your horns up. I want to see some flying emoji for yeah. this red fest. <laughs> Wow, can't believe we finally see that guitar live again. We've seen it. You guys seen it on YouTube? Yeah, that uh, was fun. It's got so many frets, so they, it sounds a little thinner, you know, but that's just the nature of the guitar. It's super light, military aircraft aluminum veneer, so built for speed. Uh, how many frets on that guitar? 29. 29. <laughs> Wow, that is an insane guitar and an insane performance, everybody. Look at this. Look at this guitar. Wow. WRC, this is a Gibson. Obviously, that is an ancient guitar one. There's never going to be another one made, but you have your own signature one. That is limited edition. That's going to go on sale, the left and the right, yeah? Yeah, it's uh, uh, we're doing a little different style. Uh, of one we took two traditional guitars two tellies so this w is the sawtooth double and we have a, a limited edition run of 50 that are it's going to be out this summer so i'm expecting some people in the audience to like give me a you know say you think you can do this angelo check this out so it's not entirely sold out yet we haven't even put it out but there's enough word of mouth that most of them are already gone so it's pretty cool if you guys want to buy one of this, this is your chance to pick one up before they're all gone. I mean, these guitars, you know, limited life is never going to lose value, you know. Of course, everybody, you guys can follow what Mikey's up to. His website, his um, YouTube, Instagram. I know you do your live stream, of course, every week on, on your Facebook. Is that right, too? Yes, yeah. Thank you so much again for giving your time for this. And it's always fun seeing you play. And... You know, Me when too. I was a kid, no way I would have thought that, you know, we get to jam like this across, you know, across the country. We're, yeah, we're thousands of miles away from each other and the whole world can watch it. You know, mm -hmm. it's just incredible. Amazing. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mikey. Thank you so much, everybody, for the incredibly...